Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, it's time for the next edition of our BBS live streams. I'm joined, as usual, by fellow co BBS uh, co founder Andrew Watson down in London. How's it going, Andrew? Yeah, pretty well. Happy Friday. Happy Friday to you. Uh, I'm also delighted to be joined by um, Cordell Lawrence, who's the uh, Director of Global Marketing and Strategy, Caleb Kilburn, who's a Master Distiller, and Joey Ryan, who's the Brand Ambassador for Peerless. How are you doing tonight, guys? Excellent. Fantastic. With a great group. Doing great. Good to hear. So, um, I don't know if you want to take it away then, Caleb, if you just want to tell us a little bit about what you're up to at the minute. Okay. Well, uh, one of the big questions that we're constantly getting is, are you all continuing to distill or are you all uh, held up at your house? And despite the fact that uh, you're going to see myself and other peerless gentlemen at home, uh, we have, I was with Cordell at the distillery less than an hour ago. Uh, we decided to come home to take care of the, uh, the teleconference. So uh, we are continuing to make bourbon. We're continuing to make rye, process barrels. We're going to start bottling the next batch of rye next week. Everything is business as usual in the back of the house. Uh, that being said, as part of our, uh, our duty to try to help beat this, uh, beat this virus, we have shut down retail. We have shut down uh, bottle sales as far as people coming into the gift shop looking at things. Even though legally we could allow that to retain open, uh, we just don't want to risk it. We don't want to risk our employees. We don't want to risk any uh, people who may want to come to support us and potentially get it. So we're keeping everyone separate. Uh, the employees that are still at Peerless are maintaining all of our social distancing. So uh, everyone's hands are nice and dry from all the hand sanitizer that's coming across them. And that's the other thing that people are always asking is about, are we making hand sanitizer? And the short answer is no. But the reason behind that is because our distillery is set up really well to make 130 proof low line or uh, high line distillery which is great for making whiskey. It's very full, it's very flavorful, very grainy. It's not nearly high enough to make hand sanitizer out of. Uh, some other larger distilleries that either have a vodka column or have uh, a, a large enough umbrella under their brand where they make vodka anyway, those are the ones that you're predominantly seeing capitalizing on uh, this kind of PR surge of, we've made hand sanitizer. Even though distilleries A, B, and C can't make it, they're using D to backfill all of them. It's a little sleight of hand in a great uh, public persona. Yep, sure it is. <laughs> um, yeah. I, wonder, I wonder if you wanted to talk a little bit about what your role is at the distillery, what maybe what okay. a typical day looks like for you, and maybe a little bit of history about the distillery. Well, I tell you what, I'll uh, I'll let Cordell tell a little bit about the history of getting Peerless up and running, and then I'll jump back in. Cool. Sure. Uh, so Peerless is really the resurrection of a pre-prohibition brand that was founded in 1889 by a gentleman named Henry Craver. Um, that operated up until the beginning of prohibition in the U.S. Uh, actually, just short of that, in 1917, was shut down uh, for the World War One efforts uh, to conserve grain to feed our troops and feed people at home. And with that, um, it was shut down through Prohibition, but during Prohibition was available as medicinal rye whiskey and bourbon. Uh, unfortunately, towards the end of Prohibition, when it could have reopened back up, uh, the assets of the company and the trademark was sold off and was never reopened again until the great grandson of Mr. Henry Craver, in our case, Corky Taylor, opened it back up in 2015 in Louisville, Kentucky, on 10th and Main Street, located within the Bourbon District, also known as Whiskey Row. So just down the street, walking distance of Forrester, Angel's Envy, Evan Williams, and the others, uh, producing everything barrel strength, non sugar, always sweet mash, and uh, everything made grain to bottle in our facility, never one ounce bought on contract. Uh, fortunate to win uh, top 20 whiskey designation with our rye whiskey, the first introduction back to the team uh, back in May of 17. And also the same award again in 18. And named the Global Craft Producer by Whiskey Magazine based in the UK in 19. And also our bourbon introduction this year was named the Best Kentucky Bourbon by Whiskey Magazine. So we've been on a quite a tear and quite a run and very fortunate to make a lot of good friends such as 
the British Bourbon Society along the way, and they're fantastic. Majeska picks still probably one of my favorite names, just because it's a nice connection. Fun we have here when you guys are in town. But uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, another thing, quick, that I'll talk on. One thing we are doing to benefit community while things are happening out there in this world that are uncertain is we have partnered with the Bartenders Guild to create a emergency relief fund that we actually distribute the portion of every sale of every single barrel from our gift shop, of course, curbside only pick up for that. And each month we're donating that check back to them that helps bartenders that are in distress and need. So that is our way of giving back. Very uh, proud, fortunate to do that. That's awesome. great. Yeah. Caleb, did you did you want to talk a little bit then about your role? Okay. So uh, myself, I, I am the master distiller for the brand. Uh, that's not a title I throw around lightly. And a lot of people uh, uh, look at me very funny when I, I tell them that I am a master distiller because I'm uh, definitely on the younger end of that scale. Uh, I am in charge of production, uh, formulation, whatever it takes to go from grain to a finished product bottle. Uh, whether that's uh, gr rough grading barrels to see which ones are going in batches, uh, which procedures we're going to do while we're cooking. And um, probably one of the funnest ones I get to do is being a part of different single barrel selections. And I, I, I know Cordell mentioned that earlier. The Majestic is probably one of the more unique uh, stories that we get to, uh, that we ever get to tell. Uh, I mean, how many barrels have we sold outside the U.S.? Not many. Uh, so for y'all to come in, for y'all to have the uh, amount of confidence in us to like our product, to like us as people, we were just really excited to uh, kind of share what we were doing. So the Majeska, I, I believe Maggie Kimbrell came up with that name. Awesome name. Uh, and uh, it's it very candied, it's very sweet, it's very airy, had a huge floral balance. Uh, it was just, it, it, it's a great barrel. Yeah, it was, a, it was a fantastic day picking that as well. I remember it vividly. We sat in that big room with the, the wooden table and leather chairs. I could, probably could have stayed there all day, to be honest, if you'd have let me. But, uh, you know, you, you lined up all the whiskeys. And what was interesting is that, you, you know, we asked your opinion. You, you said, no, you know, I'll give you my opinion at the end once you've picked what you think is the best. And don't know whether you were just blowing smoke up us or whatever, but at the end of it, you said, no, that was the one that we picked as well. So, yep. you know, I guess the, it was unanimous that this was uh, on the day, yeah. the best, better of the, uh, it, the it gets really awkward to the times where we'll come to the end of a selection. We're like, uh, what do we with that one? Yeah. <laughs> and, and usually what happens, because a little bit about the uh, single barrel program, the way we run it, the way we handle it, rather than trying to either, over curate where you're going to pick three barrels to present to a group such as yourself that all taste the same or on the other end of the spectrum where you pick just three random barrels there's never any guarantee that you're going to get unique or quality in those processes when we go through and we curate to make sure that they're all of quality we also purposely separate them out to make sure that the, the samples that you get to choose from are all going to be ultra high quality but very unique so i would be willing to bet that the three that you tasted that day when you came in number two or number three were nowhere near number one as far as flavor profile and they were all good in quality it was just how they related to your specific profile so you all like very candied very sweet very floral uh very complex and that tends to be the part of the flavor wheel that i i anchor in a little bit more because that's going to have a lot more to do with the distillation the maturation uh the fermentation things of that nature than just, oh, it's real oaky. Well, mm. the, don't get me wrong. We are very proud of our Cooperage. Uh, they, Kelvin Cooperage are just south of us in town. They make uh, not too many more barrels a day than we uh, fill. Uh, they're, they're just a craft operation, but I, I'll, I'll selfishly claim the, the glory on the, uh, the sweet floral barrels. <laughs> on the or oaky ones, I'll let them have the spotlight. That that was a that was an incredible experience as well. Being taken to the Kelvin Cooperage. Oh yeah, it was yeah. I mean the amount of barrels those guys had, and what I understand they don't typically allow tours to the public. So it was real spit and sawdust, kind of heat in your face, fire everywhere. You know, real dirty guys kind of lifting things and really noisy. It was really incredible. Exactly how you'd imagine it 
to be or want it to 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 look like. And um, yeah, and and the guy that runs it, I forget his name off the top of my William head. William or Paul. Paul. Or with the with strangest Kentucky Scottish accent I've ever heard. Yeah. It's the nice hybrid accent. <laughs> yeah, it certainly is. It certainly is. Very authentic. It's got the best of both worlds, right? Yeah. So he doesn't fit in with you all either. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> exactly. But um, so for the benefit of those at home, what makes your distillation process different from anybody else's? What what okay. makes Peerless Peerless? So the the Cordell touched on a little bit earlier. The things that are really important to us making spirit, first and foremost, is us actually making spirit. As you know, a lot of there are a lot of labels, not many distilleries. We're proud to be one of the uh, fewer uh, products in existence that's actually made, bottled, grain to bottle, all under one roof, never sourced. So. The, probably the most unique thing to us making our whiskey is the fact that we actually make our whiskey. Uh, take that one step further when you actually look at the practices deployed. We're going to start with fresh ingredients, fresh corn, rye, barley, water, first generation yeast. Everything is going to be fresh every single time, every single mash. And so what that does is it produces a very sweet, very floral, very reproducible beer. It's going to be very cost intensive. It's going to be laid labor intensive utility intensive but that consistency and that very sweet very floral beer allows me to really push the envelope when we're distilling to pull as much flavor and as much quality as we can out of the product without actually having to dip into tails or things that aren't uh, nearly as uh, appealing so we use a sweet mash we use a low distillation proof we go into the barrel to a very low proof to be a bourbon or rye you have to come or go into the barrel around 125 proof uh, that you have to come in below that. That is the absolute maximum level. But that's not the way it always was. If you look back 100, and, uh, 100 years ago when Henry Craver was making whiskey, the maximum that you could go into the barrel was 110 proof. And the reasoning behind this was at the time they wanted to make full, robust, flavorful whiskey. And so they thought that if you went into the barrel too high of a proof, you'd end up making neutral or false spirit. Well, Fast forward 60 years from uh, when Henry Craver was making it during the 1960s. Uh, at that point, neutral spirits was kicking the heck out of whiskey. And because uh, whiskey was in such a slump, they had to find a way of making it lighter flavored and lower cost to be more competitive with neutral spirits. Well, how did they do that? They got the federal government to let them increase their barrel strength. And when you increase the barrel strength, again, you increase the amount of alcohol that goes per unit of barrel so you're able to store it in a very concentrated form and then you dilute it at the end. And while it's great on logistics, it's great on flavor reduction, if you want that old time full robust whiskey, the roadmap's there. It's simple. You go in the barrel with low proof and then you don't dilute it. Once it comes out of the barrel, you don't add water to it, you don't chill filter it, you don't do anything that's going to rob flavor that you've worked so hard to create. So as, you, as I said there, the last thing that we do uh, beyond the low barrel entry proof is we serve it at barrel strength. We don't chill filter it. If it's part of a small batch, we'll take a few barrels, we'll put them together, uh, and we'll take out the charcoal. That's the only filtering would hit. On the, uh, it's not very nice if it crunches when you drink it. Uh, so we'll remove the charcoal. And then if it's a single barrel, uh, it's just one barrel process at a time, usually offered up to a special groups such as yourselves or uh, different retail shops. We'll, uh, we'll accommodate single barrel selections for them. But really, it's, those are the practices that go into making peerless peerless. What, what stood out for me with um, your whiskey very early on was that, obviously, we know it's, this barrel in particular is three years old. We know your rye is four years old, maybe five. We're coming up to five um, now. I technically have a few barrels that are five year now. It, ju it just had its birthday. <laughs> Okay, well, happy birthday. <laughs> but um, what, what stood out for me with your whiskey is that even at three years old, you were able to make it taste, how do, how do you describe it, older than its years. And it's the, it's the mouthfeel. I think my experience with craft whiskey, prior to experiencing the likes of yourselves and Wilderness Trail and, 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 and great distillers like that, is that it, it, it's been typically thin, thin whiskey, 
-hmm. it's either too you know over oaked because they've used smaller barrels what have you but this is it tastes it's that you've managed to pull so much flavor out of your process mm -hmm. but you know using you know the methods that you've you've described my question to you is do you think peerless whiskey will reach a peak at a certain age do you, have you got an idea of what that age might be is it is it six is it seven or is it just let's just wait and see it's something that we're just gonna have to wait and see uh, everything peaks everything goes through uh, uh, a building phase a plateau and then it falls it's just the nature of it i believe that we're a good number of years away from that plateau um, but we're going to inch our way toward it. Once we find it, I'd say it's about as old as you're going to see our product. But every single barrel is unique within that. And something that I didn't mention, something that's really important to uh, your perception as far as how peerless tastes and what you've seen from us, we are extraordinarily picky when it comes to grading barrels. Uh, rather than just saying, okay, we have to sell 100 barrels this year or 200 barrels this year. We don't have a set forecast of barrels that we have to reach as far as this is what we have to make ends meet or to uh, hit this perspective. Instead, what we do is myself and a small team of people, sensory specialists, will encounter a large number of samples. We go through, we grade. First and foremost is, is it ready right now for us to put our label on it and to be proud of it? And more often than not, the answer to that is no. We're a young distillery. We want those barrels to age and mature. But you do come across ones that are well beyond their years. And those are the ones that we say, okay, now let's find a spot for it. In general, most of the time, we're going to be looking for it to play a role within a batch. Uh, we're going to be working as almost as if it's a jigsaw puzzle, finding pieces that are going to plug its way around the flavor wheel. You'll find one that's sweet, one that's spicy, earthy, chocolate. You'll just keep working your way around this flavor wheel. But that being said, as you go through and you're encountering these different samples, these different barrels, occasionally you'll come across ones that are just different, ones that are special. Uh, they're deep, they're full, they're robust. They have the quality of a small batch within a single barrel. And as the name implies, those are ones that we're going to promote into our single barrel program. Uh, rather than dumping it as part of a batch, uh, we're going to find different clubs, different uh, societies, uh, liquor stores, restaurant groups, whoever it takes, uh, we're going to find someone who is ready to represent and support Peerless with an additional label. Um, that being said, we occasionally have to use them in batches. Occasionally, uh, we end up just setting them back to let them age to uh, see what they turn into in the future. Um, but overall, nothing ever hits glass, nothing ever hits a bottle that we aren't 100% behind. And as a result, that's why uh, even though we are a younger distillery, the whiskey taste is well beyond its years because we only select barrels that are well beyond their years. Are you, um, is it, well, I understand that you're probably, I would say, at the forefront of innovation when it comes to, to, to new whiskey. Is there anything that you're looking at right now as your whiskey is maturing that you're looking to change about the process, improve upon? What's the next innovation for Peerless? Well, the, the short answer is we've already made it. Um, everything that you've ever tasted from what we've distilled, everything we've done on the front end of our process was within my first 12, I'm sorry, 14 months of distilling. So all the corrections we've made, all the improvements we made, how we've made the steel more consistent, how we've made cooking a little less air prone, every step along the way that we make these small inch improvements, they haven't been realized yet. It, it, just because, again, of the five years we've been distilling, you've only seen a very small sample size of just how good the whole team at Peerless is. Uh, we have amazing distillers, and I, I can't tell you how excited they are. Uh, they've got it on the counter like my first cook was here, my first distillation was here, and I, I'm excited to see what I did and what I contributed. So it, 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 it's something where everyone has a ton of pride, and they're excited to see their contributions. Well, what's your background, Caleb? How, how did you get into all of this? Well, uh, generally when someone becomes a distiller, they're either uh, just a whiskey fanatic or uh, someone who was born into it. Uh, they have a legacy to uphold or something that, well, I, I'm a no-name from a family that didn't drink. 
So I, I, I'm a, a bit of the, the black sheep within the uh, distiller community. Uh, I myself, even when I became fascinated with distilling when I was in school, it wasn't about the whiskey. It was about the science I fell in love with. So a little background before that. I, I grew up on a dairy farm in eastern Kentucky. Uh, we milked Holsteins. And uh, it, it was an amazing way to grow up. We only had about 50 to 60 cattle milking at any given time. So a very small herd. Uh, I was the only child. Mom and dad were the only ones working it. Occasionally we'd have one work hand. So it was a very, very small operation. Am I echoing? I, th I think Cordell may need to put himself on mute. I think it's coming through his, com uh, his computer or something. You hear that, Cordell? There's no noise on this end. Yeah, there's no noise. I hear it, though. I do hear it. Yeah. Not for me. Yeah. I'm on mute. Okay. Maybe it was Joey. I'm yeah. looking at you, Joey. <laughs> that is actually okay. better. <laughs> Carry on. Sorry. Oh, no there worries. Okay. So it, it was an amazing way to grow up, and it was a very small operation, very small, tight-knit family. And that really gave me a good foundation for what it takes to actually uh, work and uh, show passion in something. So from there, I went to school. I was fascinated in biology, chemistry, physics. And it was at that point that I encountered the science of making whiskey that I fell in love with. Again, at that point, I didn't like to drink the stuff. I didn't like the way it tastes. It was just, it, it's very overwhelming when you uh, uh, decide like, okay, I want to work in whiskey. And then you try start trying it and start working your way through it and it's just whoosh, take your head off but again I was 21 22 at the time uh, I did wait until I was of legal drinking age even though I'd been researching it before uh, but I, I just I, I fell in love with it and it was an obsession uh, because everything I learned uh, would undercut something I'd understood previously so every time I would uh, read this or understand that philosophy or take that to or listen to this person speak it was constantly remolding and redefining what I understood about whiskey. And I, I just fell in love with it because of its complexity and not just because of that. It truly is an art built on science. If you don't have the scientific understanding, you can't pick up the paintbrush and really uh, paint your portrait as far as what you think of whiskey or flavor profile or double oak or whatever the product is. If you don't have a solid foundation, you can't express yourself to it. So I uh, started taking every tour I could. I started learning from anybody who'd let me shadow them. And uh, I was about, uh, as a couple years into this journey, I attended a course through uh, Moonshine University, uh, Distilled Spirits Epicenter here in Louisville, that introduced me to a lot of really good people who mentored me, who uh, shared what they knew with me. Uh, but it was the following year, all while I was still in school, that I became, uh, I was a uh, I was introduced to Carson and Corky Taylor, who are the family ownership behind Peerless. And they, uh, they met with me and they agreed to let me come on board, not as a distiller, not as uh, the heir to the throne or anything like that. I, I got to saw and stack lumber and shovel gravel. And I was excited to do it because I wanted to see this distillery come together. And I was quiet. I listened. I just wanted to see and learn. But when I'd, I'd notice a valve going in the wrong place or I'd notice that they needed to rework some piping or some things like that i would step in and i'd make corrections and after doing this three or four times uh carson corky and the different uh general contractors on site recognized that thanks to my dairy background i was the only one who was littered in the process littered in how it needed to go together had insight on how it needed to go together and uh, it, it was just because of my mechanical background i was the only guy on site who was equipped to build a distillery basically so i uh i at 22 23 was able to convince all these engineers all these uh battle-hardened veterans of the construction industry and distilling industry that i was the one who need to lay out the process piping and the mechanical system the distillation equipment and before it's over even and keep in mind i was still in school i was bouncing this last semester of school with uh, going as far as actually programming the distillery central computer that controls the stills and the cooking and the fermenters and the doubler and everything involved in the process. So I was, uh, I was blessed to uh, really not know how far in I was in over my head, uh, but I kept chugging. I was able to make it work. And 
I was just blessed to have opportunity after opportunity to uh, keep pursuing my dream. Uh, that being said, as Cordell mentioned, once we got up in distilling, we started making product. We never looked back. We uh, were able to take our rye whiskey when a whiskey of the, or 2015, or I'm sorry, 2017 number 15 whiskey in the world. Uh, the following year, we got uh, number four American whiskey with that same rye. Uh, and we just kept taking after accolade after accolade, even going as far as getting the global craft producer of the year for 2019. Well, all that stacked up, all that kind of got to Carson Corky. So even though I had maintained that I wanted to wait for the title, uh, at the company Christmas party, they presented me with the master distiller title. And that was, uh, that was just, it's such a special moment. I cried, they cried, we all cried. It was, uh, it was, uh, it was touching. So yeah, I'm, uh, I'm living the dream. It's it's an incredible story. I mean, don't know about you, Chris, but at 22, 23, I wasn't thinking about anything like that. I was uh, probably <laughs> drinking JD and Coke and probably yeah. more of it coming out. I wish I was. And going in. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, the benefit of hindsight, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, but I mean, you're clearly a very uh, driven individual, very good at what you do, very learned and... Yeah, I mean, it's, it's testament to what you're producing today. But um, question for you, who, what, in your journey to get to where you are now, who, who would you say has been your biggest whiskey influence? The biggest whiskey influence? Yeah. Uh, I'm going to have to do a three-way tie. The, the three people who mentored me within the industry who were just phenomenal, who really helped me, one is going to be Pete Kamer, who's a retired distiller engineer from Barton Brands. A uh, consultant took me under his wing. Uh, he showed me how he built several different distilleries, designed several different schemes. Uh, and he, I, I actually just got off the phone with him. Uh, in between seeing Cordell at the distillery an hour and a half ago and coming here, I had about a 30-minute talk with him about uh, X, Y, and Z and things that we could change and work on. And it just he continues to be an excellent resource for me. Another one is Randy Allender, who's a distiller engineer. Um, out of Jim Beam Brands, who's retired and consulting now. Similar setup, amazing fellow, very patient, heart of a teacher, just great guy. And then um, uh, Rob Sherman, who's the president of Vendome Copper and Brass Works, which uh, the majority of y'all may not know, but Vendome is North America's amazing uh, producer of distillation equipment. Anybody who's anybody has distillation equipment made by Vendome Copper and Brass. So uh, between the three of them, I had an excellent technical foundation, not just in distilling or palleting, uh, but all the way down to how you manage your workforce, how you uh, interact, how you train, how you tune boilers and fix, uh, fix pumps. It's just uh, they were amazing uh, people, technicians who were just, they had the hearts of teachers. Fantastic. Um, Chris, have we got uh, some questions to ask? I mean, I could, I yeah, could go we, on all we, night. We have, I'll, I'll, be, uh, I'll be denying the members that. So. Sure, yeah, I mean, we've got some questions. I just wondered as well, though, I mean, what I, just, I, I was just thinking about our trip, and we, I mean, we did some really cool stuff when we went to visit you guys in Louisville. I wondered if Cardell wanted to talk a little bit about the Penn Dennis Club, because I thought that was a really cool experience that, that we had while we were over there. Oh, no, thanks for that. It was a pleasure hosting you all. It was a lot of fun. Um, so the Pendennis Club is an old, traditional uh, gym club of the old version, you would think, of the Gentleman's Club, not the modern-day interpretation of that. Um, and with that, it was kind of a place for um, politeness, quorum, uh, a place where you would court um, ladies back in the day and also have social gatherings. And it was the same site uh, in downtown Louisville, actually walking distance from Peerless, where the old-fashioned cocktail that became famous in New York and around the world was first invented. Um, it's actually the house cocktail, and it's the official cocktail of the city of Louisville. Most people often think of the mint julep uh, as being the official cocktail. That's the official cocktail of the Derby. The official cocktail of the city is actually the old-fashioned cocktail. Um, invented there and had the pleasure of bringing uh, Chris and Andrew and the rest of the group there to have an old fashioned together, which was a lot of fun. Made with Payless, of course. <laughs> yes, of course, it has to be, right? Uh, and the bartenders there, most of them worked there 30 plus years and had a lot of uh, fun stories. You know, if walls could talk, it's that kind of place. There's a traditional boxing night event every year where they have uh, college boxers come in and fight one another and you dress up in uh, black tie and 
kind of place your bets and have some cocktails together. It's a uh, always a unique place to to be. In fact, I was lucky enough to have my wedding reception at the fish club. A lot of fun. Cordell, you're you're a beer fan as well, aren't you? Of which there are many members in the BBS that are big beer fans as well. On the trip that we took, you took us to Monic. I think we went to Against the Grain. There was another one. You're, uh, are you still collaborating with, with any any others? Or no? Great question. So, in fact, we have some bottles. We're going to save a few, uh, Chris and yourself, of our Monic collaboration. So we took a French farm style Saison from Monic and they aged it in rye whiskey barrels and the result is frankly the best collaboration beer we've produced. Period. Wow. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Uh, come back to your bottle. I'll see you got some photos too. It's that sounds incredible. The entire staff. I remember that um that brown ale in Monic. I've never had yep. a brown ale like it before or since. It was delicious. It was called the King George. Yeah, uh, the King tasted. George. Some respect to you all, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's appreciated. But, um, yeah. Um, Do you want me to get some yeah. of these questions from the members that the members have put into us? Yeah, sure, let's do it. So f first question comes from uh, Mark Lattimore, and he says, uh, he asks, do you think that a better distillate improves the chances of a greater final product or does the effect of climate, age, wood uh, and all the other influences contribute so much that it can polish away any kind of discrepancies or funk from the distillate? I am going to say you got to put it in good for it to come out good. There are some people who claim that the, uh, the barrel can polish away all that you want. It's just you... I can't think of many uh, politically correct sayings I can say now, but you, you can't put lipstick on a pig. It just, it's not going to turn out good when you uh, put something in the barrel that's not, it's not good. Um, well, we don't, have to, we don't have to be politically correct here, Caleb. <laughs> well, I, that was a song. You say what you want. <laughs> lipstick on a pig was the one I was looking for. <laughs> Uh, we got we got on from that, Ryan. Sorry, sorry. Okay. To, to be perfectly honest, uh, it wasn't a politically correct issue. My, uh, I, I come from Eastern Kentucky. Appalachia has their own uh, list of sayings and phrases and things that mean nothing to anyone. Uh, so when I was trying to say that, I went to something that was going to make me sound uh, like a bit of a hillbilly. Uh, but <laughs> since we're already talking about it, I'll explain. Uh, <laughs> My, my grandfather always had this saying, you can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. So out of a pig's ear, you can't form something that is just immaculate and perfect and great. Well, if you put bad whiskey in a barrel, you can't make an amazing product from it. So I was going to go with a very Eastern Kentucky saying there. That's a, it's a good well, phrase. <laughs> when you say you can't polish a turd, but you can put glitter on it. Well, I was trying not to say turd either. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Typical Watson. Okay. There we go. Yeah. Lower the tone. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. There um, we go. I've had one. I've had a whiskey. Yeah, it, we're off now. <laughs> we got we got one from a uh, uh, Ryan Prescott, who's a who's a bartender in Cane and Grain in Manchester, um, and he said he's working on an article for a competition with the brief title "The Rise of Rye," and he'd like to get your insight on how rye fits in the history of American whiskey and what you think it offers to the final distillation. I tell you what, Cordell, I think you're, uh, I think you're up. Yeah. So as far as uh, rye whiskey, it's very interesting because it's really, if you think about it, America's original native spirit. You know, bourbon is often kind of used in the same connotation or the same terminology as being America's native spirit, and there's some truth to that. But rye whiskey really was used as a way for uh, immigrants at the time. Uh, this was still when the colonies were around, and it was kind of a rebellion against uh, the United Kingdom, against Great Britain, uh, because rum at the time was actually used for trade for various goods and used as uh, a form or means of exchange between them. And a lot of the farm distilleries uh, made rye whiskey, even if it wasn't for a business enterprise. It, it was kind of to show the rebellious side and show them that they're not. 
uh, as the colonies, the 13 colonies, the United States of America coming later, of course, as you all know. But um, yeah, so there's a lot of heritage around rye. Even in fact, George Washington produced rye with exclusively on his uh, farm there, um, known as Mount Vernon, which is just outside of DC. So there's a lot of kind of heritage and history around that. Most of that was in the Virginia, Washington, D.C., Pennsylvania, and Maryland areas. That's why you kind of still hear about Monocula rye, Pennsylvania rye. Most of that went away and then was absorbed by the Kentucky distilleries on, but uh, frontier distillers and are still in Kentucky at the same time period, but typically making bourbon because of how plentiful corn was in Kentucky at the time. That was kind of the dominant um, agricultural product in the state. Yeah, so it's kind of interwoven Kentucky history, early colonial history, and then kind of um, the rest is history, as they say, as far as the U.S. goes. Yeah, rye whiskey is kind of having its moment again. It's fantastic in cocktails, particularly uh, Manhattan cocktail, kind of sweet there, and then also the Azarac cocktail with the absent water. Thank you. And uh, any any more insight into what you think it offers into the final product, rye? What I mean, what do you think are the main characteristics, I guess, of rye, of using rye as a grain? Well, as so far I, as during the distillation, as far as on the production side, it's going to be very spicy, very earthy. Uh, but particularly when you distill at low proof, it also pulls in a lot of sweetness. Uh, it, I, I find rye when it matures. Uh, it, it's sweetness isn't like corn. Corn is very dried, very aromatic. It's more like a, it's more similar to like a cane sugar. Meanwhile, when you look at uh, the sweetness that is generated from rye, it's almost more like molasses. It's very grassy, very earthy, very dark. And more often than not, we're getting a lot of kind of a burnt, uh, like a brulee sugar characteristic to it. But again, obviously very grainy, very earthy, very spicy as its hallmark tones. Thank you. Um, we've got a question from Andy Mantel, which is, I guess, about the, the production facility and your barrel management, which is, um, can you explain how you store the barrels and age them? Uh, is it is the temperature control? Is it left to nature? And how many barrels do you have to move around on what kind of basis? So we are very fortunate. We've built our downtown warehouse and our uh, outside of Louisville warehouse, both single story. Uh, both of which don't require rotation because they're going to generate very similar temperature conditions, very similar airflow. Uh, so everything's going to be roughly the same. It's not a massive warehouse that's uh, seven stories high. It's one story. And just a uh, context uh, up front, we are not a massive distillery. We're not a Jim Beam. We're not a Jack Daniels. For difference of scale, at one of the two Jim Beam facilities, they make as many barrels in a day as I make in a year. I mean, it, we are not a big distillery. Uh, so that being said, we're going to be filling 10 to 12 barrels a day. Uh, those have to be put up. They have to be rigged. We'll have a team of people doing that. Uh, when we send barrels out to the other warehouse, we'll send it on a truckload. Uh, we'll have a large truck and trailer haul it out there. It'll be about 80 barrels to load that way. Um, there is no temperature. Uh, Funny business, no heat cycling. We just leave it up to Mother Nature. We have a lot of windows here in Kentucky. When it gets hot, it gets up uh, around 100. It gets in excess of 100 degrees Fahrenheit. I can't uh, pull out my translation right off the cuff. I apologize. Uh, and then on the other end, we in the winter, we'll regularly see temperatures below zero. So it's uh, it gets very cold and it gets very hot. So naturally our climate's gonna heat cycle the whiskey. It's gonna help it drive in to pull out or uh, to have access to a lot of caramels, vanillas, sugars, oaks, tannins, all the things that come from that barrel. While when it gets cold, pulling in fresh oxygen, fresh air, that's gonna help a lot of the organic acids break down and over time become very sweet, and very aromatic compounds. Thank you. And, um... We've got a really good question from Scott Carline, which I think you explained to me on the uh, on the day we, we visited you, or maybe John did. Um, what's the story behind the bottle? Because obviously this is a really cool bottle. This is you know this is yeah. one of the most ornate bottles in in, in whiskey, really. Um, what can you can you speak a little bit about that and, and 
I mean, there's, there's so much to this bottle. I remember hearing on the day. Uh, are, you, are you okay to talk a little bit about that? So the bottle is actually designed by the fifth generation owner, Carson Taylor. Um, he didn't hire a firm. He didn't hire some engineer. He just did it himself. Um, he, uh, he, he'd always desired to bring back some of the old world feel and look from the, because as Cordell mentioned, this is not a new brand. This is the resurrection of a really old brand. So the front label is actually inspired by an old medicinal label from a bottle that they had been able to uh, hold over that they were able to locate from the original Peerless Distilling Company. So the vertical stripe, the Peerless, the italicized, it, all that is original. Uh, now, obviously, with modern uh, tax and trade rules, we did have to splice certain pieces of information. We had to pull certain statements and just uh, make sure that it was compliant. But overall, it, that's the throwback on the label. Now, the bottle is actually loosely based on our distillery's pot doubler, which is a uh, piece of distilling equipment after the column before the final distillation. It's part of that final distillation. So it's the pot still that we deposit our low wine into, still away our finished distilled spirit. Uh, so the rivets, the uh, uh, what's called the onion, which is the uh, oval uh, piece of metal on top, uh, that's based off of the uh, the distillery's pot doubler. And if you ever go, if you ever want to look at it, just Google Kentucky Peerless, uh, take a look at it on the website, you'll be able to see the resemblance. The last thing though is you'll notice that there's a one inch thick glass uh, pedestal on the bottom and that's there because we actually put our product on a pedestal. That's what we like to tell people. <laughs> so the people who <laughs> blow that glass, Rather than sourcing from uh, China, where it would be about a third the cost, we choose to have it American made. It's made just outside of Atlanta, Georgia. And the same people who blow our glass uh, specialize in the ultra clear virgin glass like perfume bottles where uh, it'll be a it'll block that big with about that much perfume in it. That crystal clear, perfect glass. They blow that also. So it's definitely a specialized bottle that requires a specialized uh, processor. Thanks. I think I think um, when we went there, what, something that that's kind of uh, a signifier of is the attention to detail that you guys have. And um, I remember a really cool story that Corky told us as well about about the uh, DSP number that you got, which uh -huh. which, which was uh, the, from his great grandfather's distillery. Do you want to mention a little bit about that? I wonder. Sure. So the original distillery was in Henderson, Kentucky, and it was the, the 50th distilled spirits plant. So it was DSP KY50. So when they shut down, they uh, chose not to sell off the brand names. They uh, held on to some of the property, but they sold the distillation equipment. And they were shut down. But in some way or another, the family never chose to sell off the brand name Peerless. So fast forward 98 years later to when we're distilling that first uh, barrel of Kentucky Pearls in 100 years. Uh, at that point, we had went back to the Tax and Trade Bureau. We presented our case. It was the same family, the same brand name. Uh, we were able to get them to reissue our original DSP. Number. So modern ones were in the 20,000s. Uh, we were able to go all the way back to 50 because it was the same family, same legacy, same vision. And uh, we were uh, pioneers on that front. Now, since then, several other people have piggybacked on the president or the precedent that we set. Uh, but we were the first to go back and uh, reclaim a, this DSP number. Nice. Um, Samuel Sussman has asked about the small batch. He says, how many barrels tend to go into your small batch? And how do you go about the blending process to kind okay. of create this perfect profile that you, that you get out of the final product? The very when we very first started, we were doing about six barrels, and that was about it. Uh, but thanks to a lot of really good supporters out there, thank you all. Uh, we were able to uh, uh, we had more demand, we had more uh, more throughput. So we've actually pushed it up to around twenty barrels a batch right now, but it's still processed in about six barrel increments. So what we'll do is we'll pull the barrels in, uh, we'll start processing again from a list of ones that we've graded to fit. Uh, into this puzzle. We'll get it about 80% of the way assembled. We're going to taste it and see what kind of progress we have. And we're going to pinpoint where on the flavor wheel we need to make bolder. Uh, typically, we're going to be going back to single barrels in particular because they're going to be most pronounced in certain areas of the flavor wheel. 
and using them to provide sweetness or spice or finish or whatever we need to contribute. We're going to select probably about four or five barrels there at the end to put in to really bring the batch all together. And who is it that oversees that process? What's that? Whose job is it to, to oversee that process? You nice That's job. <laughs> I've got a question. Um, other than drinking it straight, of course, yep. people have got a lot of time on their hands, right? What would you say is the best thing you can do with peerless such as, you know, do you have a particular recipe? Is there a cocktail? Well, I, I, I believe uh, variety is the spice of life. I prefer you not try one cocktail with it. I'd just go after it. And what's your, again, what's your folks, favorite? Folks, for me personally, I like, I like sour things. Uh, so whiskey sours, uh, even Kentucky mules. If I like, uh, if I'm going after some ginger, uh, I'm not a huge, uh, I'm not a really big fan of uh, Bloody Mary's, but I've heard that our whiskey makes an amazing Bloody Mary, particularly the rye because it's very spicy. It complements a lot of what's already going on within that, uh, that cocktail. And one thing that you may know, I'm sure you're aware of when you're, doing a cocktail with vodka, you're not doing it because vodka is going to contribute any flavor to that cocktail. You're just trying to slide under the table in the alcohol you need to basically make the other uh, components make you intoxicated. So <laughs> when you're talking about a cocktail that incorporates whiskey or rum or tequila or any of these other actual flavorful and bold uh, spirits, those are ones that you're looking to complement. You're looking to enhance. You're looking to pair different notes and different flavors with that. So for me personally, I like ones that take a flavor within the whiskey and just takes off and runs with it. So again, is this the blood, is this thing, it's not my personal favorite, but I love where it's going. Uh, but when you're talking about sours, uh, mules, things of that nature, something that's sweet and refreshing. To, to be honest, you, you had me at Bloody Mary. I love a Bloody Mary. Yeah. So I'm probably going to make that. Have you, have you got that recipe, by the way? <laughs> uh, I do not personally, uh, but whatever your favorites, I mean, if you like Bloody Marys, I'm sure you have your standard recipe that you love. Just one for one, swap out your vodka with the rye that you have there. And it's going to be stronger, but I think you can handle that. I think you're correct. <laughs> that, that's just one of the benefits. That's one of the perks. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Occupational hazard. <laughs> A 40% boost in alcohol content. Yes, please. There you go. Breakfast whiskey. Breakfast whiskey. We got we got a couple more questions and then we'll draw it to a close if that's okay, guys. Sounds yeah. perfect. Um, Sam Sussman asked about the distilling process and um, he says, "Do you think it's become more scientific than art in your time in the industry?" Okay, so this is going to be a real complicated question because I actually don't believe that it's become more scientific as far as the overall arching process, but the way you utilize technology does. And let me break that down. Let me explain that a little bit. Uh, from the standpoint of analytical chemistry or computer technology or things of that nature, yeah, there, there's a definitely a lot more computer-based distillation. There's definitely a lot more analytical chemistry-based distillation. But as far as actually working the overall process, the actual process design, I believe it's just as technically complicated now as it was back then. Uh, you, you think about it. If you're, if you're talking 150 years ago, when sour mash kind of became the industry standard within the industry, you're talking about people who didn't have a clue what role yeast or that there were yeast, how this, that, or the other played within it. They knew trial and error empirically what worked. So when you talk about the complexities of distilling without an understanding of microbiology or a source of yeast or the ability to say, computer, give me this many pounds of steam, where instead you're running through a chain of people who are looking at little dials running a uh, hectic, like mad scientists, like the classical, uh, uh, imagine Frankenstein in his castle trying to make whiskey run around and flipping switches. That's what it was like. I, I think if anything, it's got a little simpler since we've introduced some technology. Uh, just me personally. Thanks. And then uh, last question we've got is from Scott Carlion. Um, he wants to know if you're going to try any different expressions of the brand in the future in terms of finishes. And maybe that question could be expanded to say, 
is is there anything else you guys have got going on anything you're working on that we might see in the future oh absolutely uh like we said a lot of the innovation you've seen so far has just been within the first 12 months of our distilling uh we have uh, another mash bill that we're working on for in the future that's a high rye bourbon uh, we still just have the same proof at the moment, but in the future, we do plan on having a higher proof expression, uh, limited small batch. Uh, we have done in the context of a barrel finish, we actually work with Copper and Kings. I don't know if you all visited Copper and Kings when you're in Louisville, uh, but we've done a, uh, a barrel finish, our first barrel finish. And uh, let me preface this with just a little bit. We originally uh, were very standoffish as far as doing barrel finishes just for the purpose of we wanted to walk before we ran. We wanted to establish ourselves as having a great bourbon, having a great rye, before we ever took the steps of finishing in this or uh, adding that or doing anything else. But uh, considering how Perils has rose and uh, in accolade, how things went for us, we felt that we were ready to uh, – sorry, we've got a storm brewing outside. Did you hear that thunder and lightning? I did <laughs> Yeah, anyway, not for you all, for here anyway. So uh, we uh, we set out to do a collaboration with Copper and Kings and to do a barrel finish. And so I went down and I had a little bit of our rye whiskey and I went through just medicine dropper dot, 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 dot across our whole, whole portfolio. And rather than doing a barrel finish, it's a little more common where you use brandy or sherry or uh, something that's going to be sweeter, uh, something that's going to be the typical, the norm. I went way out of left field and I did a rye whiskey finish in an absinthe barrel. So this is uh, draws on a lot of the same notes and contribution that you see from that absinthe wash in a Sazerac cocktail. Uh, it's very herbal, it's very sweet, it's super heavy. Uh, when you add that little bit of essence of that to the rye whiskey, rather than playing on similar notes, like I was saying, uh, if you finish something sweet with bourbon, it's just note on note. It's, it kind of gets muddled, kind of gets lost. Instead, this is something that's right on the nose. The saying he knows it. It's like candy. It's sweet. It's heavy. It's oily. And then if you just work through all these layers, it, there's just so much to unpack. Now, I, I taste it. We've had it done now for a little while. I, I could taste it every day of the week, and I'm going to be able to pull out a different note. It's just amazingly complex. So that's one of the many things that we're working on at Peerless. That sounds really well, interesting. Take, take my money. What's your PayPal address? Yeah. I'll send it across you in a minute. <laughs> yeah, that's Cord awesome. Cordell have to smuggle that to you. Yeah. Exactly. That's we'll be the first time. <laughs> right. G guys, um, thank you so much for your time. We're, we're nearly up to the hour now, so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll let you get back to doing what you were doing. We're, we're very grateful for you to join in us tonight um, and hopefully we'll see you again soon. So thank you very much, guys. Thank you. Yes, all. Thank, you. Yes. thank you all for all the support. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you, Caleb. Thanks, Cordell. Thanks, everyone. Cheers. Cheers, guys.